So I think I'm going to have to poke a few holes in some of the organization that came before us. Um, because from my point of view as a student, and I think Dick will probably concur, all of this development seems very logical, very organized, the way it was presented this morning. I think our student experience was something less than very logical and very organized. I mean, we were an undefined profession in a totally unstructured environment. The NCCPA did not exist. The AAPA existed, but so did three other organizations. They had not yet merged into one. There was no enabling legislation. There was no way to get credentialed in the hospital. There was no way to do anything. We didn't know who we were, and it was very difficult to tell other people who we were because we didn't know either. <laughs> All those professors that they talked to about teaching us, I would say the first five to 10 minutes of every class was spent explaining why we needed to know what it was they were supposed to be teaching us. Um, there were some of the surgeons that thought we really needed to know very fine details, surgical anatomy, so that we could anticipate the instruments they would need at any stage of an operation. <laughs> so that in our minds, you know, back then the, people referred to the type A, but I don't know if a lot of you know there was a type B and a type C. <laughs> and a lot of the surgeons here uh, thought that we were going to be super OR techs. We clearly had other ideas um, that didn't always get well received by some of the professors we talked to um, who attempted to teach us what they thought we should know. So it was a pretty chaotic time. I mean, actually, having just taken the NCCPA for the <coughs> sixth or seventh or whatever time, um, I'm surprised that we ended up with a foundation of knowledge that has enabled us to continue to practice clinically all these years because it was kind of crazy. Um, I think. However, that that undefinedness allowed some of us the absolute privilege of putting what we thought should be what this profession was all about. We were not going to be content to be mindless robots technicians. We were thinking, decision making, differential diagnostic kinds of professionals. Uh, and it took a long time to get that through a lot of places. Um, There was no organization. There was no student organization. And I think that some of us realized that if we were ever going to grow and function into what we thought we should become, that a lot of our energy was devoted to structure. I mean, Dick and I sort of elected each other as uh, the founding president and secretary of the Jack Cole Society. Because when Bruce's class started, there were finally enough of us to be able to have all the right officers because there weren't enough of us to do that. Um, and it, it early became apparent that, that if we provided the structure for the organization from within rather than from without, it would become what we wanted it to be. I, I think one of my fondest memories in getting the Connecticut Academy of Physician Assistants um, organized is there were a lot of us, and we were the new health professionals, we were physician assistants, we, were, we weren't even sure who we were back then. And we finally had this set of bylaws, and it came time to vote on it. And we realized that we didn't know how to tell who had the right to vote, because we had a series of different people. And at that point, there were some nurse practitioners that were kind of hanging with us, and could we create one organization in Connecticut, like a couple of other states successfully did, we were not successful at doing that. It ended up with a, a schism and, and just became physician assistants. But that undefined nature was something that followed us through, through everything. I mean, when I was hired, um, I chose to stay at Yale New Haven Hospital when I graduated because one of the things that I sadly missed as a student was a role model of what I was supposed to look like. That was pretty hard in 1971. I mean, we had a PA in the program. But he was an administrator, so you know I didn't want to do what he was doing. So you didn't have that clinical role model. So I chose to stay at Yale for 10 years. And it was like, OK, you can work here. Well, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Try to get credentialed at an Ivy League hospital when their credentialing holes are round and your title is square. And by the way, for the state of Connecticut, I'm informally trained. Because the program was not accredited when I was a student. 
So the state of Connecticut doesn't recognize the fact that, you know, I spent two years at the Y School. Um, Bruce is also um, informally trained. Uh, after that, those people, they all went to school. We just didn't, that's all. I think one of the things that sticks out in my mind, story time, is I was on call. I was actually at a meeting uh, at the department chair's house. We were talking about a new protocol. Every physician I worked with was there, but I was the one on call. Somebody got sick, they needed antibiotics. I went in, you know, saw the patient, did my thing, wrote the orders, went back to the meeting. The next day, the evening nurse came up to me in tears and said she couldn't talk to me anymore. We couldn't be friends anymore because the nursing supervisor had told her that if she ever followed another one of my orders, she would get fired. So that very nice thing about supervision, direction, delegation was so undefined that it left an incredible amount of room. You could define supervision as over the shoulder. You could define supervision as telecommunication. And depending upon what you thought about what these upstart people that were running around maybe killing people were, that, that initial legislation left so much room for your own interpretation of what it was that it was a source of lots of conflict. I think I'll stop and let Dick say something, because I can go on. <laughs> I'm a little bit different tracked here, perhaps. Um, uh, from my heart, I'd like to thank so much that that we're all being, still being able to sit here, um, and Yale for coming through. I mean, it, it was chaotic. It was changing day to day. Um, and people didn't know who we were, including the people that were instructing us. We didn't know who we were. And yet, at the end of that time, I felt that I had the most intense I'd never intense the event uh, in my life, certainly the most stimulating. I never worked so hard but enjoyed it so much before or after. Uh, I felt and learned that I was prepared as much as one can be. Uh, I had an excellent foundation. And then, of course, my learning went on as, as when you leave school, if there are students here, you're just beginning to learn. Um, but uh, again, I thank you. <laughs> That's fine. Was that a lub or was that a dub? I, I'm not sure. Um, I thank you for uh, continuing this profession and and helping support. And it's remarkable that now, at 40 years, we're still and expanded so much, and, and uh, those early struggles were not in vain by many of you. Uh, and those, those who were so insightful in, in seeing what the potential was uh, and holding to it against some very, very strong, uh, permanent, fixed things, and, it's, and it even especially in an institution like this, where things tend to be fixed and uh, remarkable. Anyway, um, I just kind of like then instead of kind of move more toward anecdotal kinds of things that, that, that help, that maybe help you understand what we as new PAs way back um, experienced. One of the things, of course, is my great fear is that I, would, I, sp I came across the country from Montana, uh, direct to Yale. I came from an Indian reservation where I was working at the time. Talk about culture shock. But then I spent two intense years here. Um, but then there was always, is somebody, is a patient going to see me? Are they going to listen to me? Am I going to really be able to use this wonderful training? So I have a couple anecdotal things uh, that I might kind of throw out. Um, um, Dr. Satter talked about um, dress code. We were we strictly spit and polish. yes, spit and polish. And and at that time, and I don't know what it is now, but medical students 
in this same institution did not have a strict dress code, to say the least. So in our learning, many times we were with interns, medical students, we made rounds with everybody, and we would hopefully find the best teacher, follow them in this group of sometimes 20 people, run into a, a room, the patient is laying there, somebody had present the patient to, the, to everyone, everybody had talk about this and this, and, and, uh, um, and almost always the uh, professor had the white coat. Well, we certainly had our white coat, okay? And then there were, of the other 20 people there, there were various forms of dress. So in this particular patient, I remember, uh, patients laying there and looking at all the, all the, and people are talking and pulling up things and, and she's like this. And at the end of that time, um, the professor says, do you have any questions? He says, yes. I know you're a doctor and I know you're a doctor, but who in the heck are the rest of these people? <laughs> and and to, the, to you students, appearance is important. It's important. People make judgments of that. They're scared. They're, they're afraid. They need people to help guide them. And they're looking to see where that is going to come from. And part of that is visual. So students, try to remember that one. Early in clinical rotations, after the didactic section, we had, of course, rotations for periods of time with different entities. Um, I believe this was a surgical rotation, and I was attached to one of the surgeons, and we were called to the emergency room here in Yale New Haven. Came into the emergency room and to the suite where they were, and it was chaos, and you could see blood on the floor, and I could see tennis shoes, and um, there was a young person who had um, an obvious uh, tibial fracture, which was uh, open, bones were present, and there were, you know, if you've been in the emergency room, you know that things are going, trying to ha help this patient. And so somebody's hanging up this, somebody else is writing over here, somebody's yelling out orders, somebody's checking this, hanging the IV, and so on and so on. So um, I'm there, and I'm just on the first few days with the surgeon, and, um, and he's, he takes a look, and he takes charge, and he starts, he starts barking out orders to everyone, and has this been done, and then it's done. And they were preparing to take the patient to the OR for, for repair. At, at this time, uh, he turns around quickly and bumps into me, because I learned that I have to stay real close, and that's where, you know, <laughs> and try to catch what information that you can as you go along, and you write it down, and then go back and learn it. Okay, and, this, and I'm new to this all thing. So he turns around and bumps into me almost, and he looks startled, and he looks at my name tag, because he didn't even know me yet, and he said, Paul, uh, go assess that patient. And partly he was saying, Get out of my way, I'm trying to get this all done, you know. <laughs> Do something. So, you know, so I go over and I think, okay, my training. What do I do? Assessment. Airway. Okay, breathing. Circulation. So I'm doing this. Okay, 90 second exam. Quick exam, head to toe. So I'm looking, looking at eyes, getting close, smelling, because this is what I was trained to do. I'm running my hands over the patient, okay? and I'm looking, okay? And as I come around behind the skull, it's soft. And I think, no, it's not supposed to be soft. <laughs> no. And I look at my fingers and it's red, another clue, <laughs> okay? This is before universal precautions, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and then I follow the protocol. I continue my exam, going on down, moving, but the quick exam. Da 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 da, stethoscope, listening to the chest, let it go. And now I'm elbowing my way through all kinds of other uh, interns and nurses of trying to help this patient. So I work my way down, I finish it quickly, I go over, and, and uh, 
the um, surgeon is his back to me and he's doing one of these and I go, you know, he looks at me and, and then he says, what? And I say, I, I think the patient has, has a depressed skull fracture. What do you mean? So we, he walks over and, and I, I show him. And then he, of course, changes. He starts yelling out new sets of orders. <laughs> okay? And obviously the priorities are changing here. We've got an emergent problem that must be addressed right away. And so, and as things turned out, um, the patient was sent to the, the, the OR soon, right after imaging, and, and the patient survived and, and did well. Um, the leg was taken care of later. <laughs> okay, but the, I guess the point here, oh, at the end of this situation then, uh, the patient was out of the room and, and, and um, everybody is kind of tidying up just a little bit and the surgeon kind of makes a stern face and then he says, everybody, stop. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've done something. <laughs> and he says, Listen, this patient was here for 35 minutes. We were working on everything but the primary problem. The patient was not properly assessed. I have a, a student who is a PA student who came, assessed it, and in 60 seconds came to me with a, another new problem. This will not happen again, and he went on. And of course, I'm shrinking down, <laughs> and, and, and I'm getting looks from everyone else. But I guess the point is I didn't, didn't know how to cut corners yet. I had good training. I knew what to do. I followed my protocol and my learning, and perhaps helped the patient. So again, thanks to Yale for that. I think you've heard a little bit. heard a little bit today about how being in the right place at the right time can do something. I, I need to, you know, share a story of something that happened to me. And if I go on about how undefined and how chaotic things were then, let me also say it totally added to the fun. And <laughs> given what I know now, if I could start over again, I would have sort of gotten it much faster because I had a much better image in my mind. So, so for me, being part of a new profession, was just an incredible amount of fun. And those professional organizations provided a training ground. So as I ended up in hospital management later on in my career, the mistakes in managing I made when I was a volunteer, and it's a lot harder to fire a volunteer, so that some of us did our management training within the AAPA or CONAPA or one of those PA organizations, so that when we did it for real in a paid position, we were much more effective than we would have been if we hadn't have had that background. I was a second year student. Um, it was in May of, May, June of my second year. And the rotation I was on was ending on Friday and I didn't know where I was going. Um, and I went to the executive director's office and said, Paul, where am I going on Monday? He said, uh, there might be a problem with that. I'll tell you later. Paul, it's three o'clock on Friday afternoon. When are you gonna tell me? Uh, let me make a phone call, come back in about half an hour. Maybe you should take Monday off. I knew this was a problem. They never gave us any time off. The only time off we had during our academic year was one of our classmates got married. So we had a week off so he could go back to Iowa and get married. Um, and that, that was our spring break. Um, but I was supposed to go on an internal medicine rotation starting on Monday morning. And sometime late the week before, this local small hospital, which needs to remain nameless, um, decided that they were not ready to allow in their institution someone who could come in and kill all their patients. They were very leery of what was gonna happen and they just decided they were not ready to join this experiment and be part of what was happening. Fortunately, the um, executive director's wife was the administrative assistant of a local university department. She said with her chairman out of town, 
Uh, it's okay, we'll take Verdeen. Now, the chairman didn't know that she said that, so I have this program placement rotation, we had a lot of those, um, in medical oncology starting on Monday. The problem was that someone who knew I was doing it ran into the chairman before she got to tell him that they had offered to take a PA student. Um, serendipitous for me, I spent the next 38 years in medical oncology. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those good things that may have not happened for a good reason, but clearly led me into what became my life work clinically. Um, and one of the things that I would like to do, um, if you don't mind. Whatever. Is, is I, know, I know people didn't have time for any questions um, of Fred and Blair and Ann, but if, if there's anything that we can relate, if people have questions about specific as aspects of what it was like to be where we were when we were there, some of you weren't very far behind us, um, but about the way things changed or how we managed to do some things. I mean, I, I think that we would be more than happy to take questions. Yes, Bert? Bertine, uh, since we're doing memories of the past, sure. I think a moment to reflect on all of those non-physicians who were part of our environment, our teaching environment, who were actually the ones that were really responsible for teaching us our craft, teaching us medicine, and teaching us health. In particular, like, the Kralins, who, who were not physicians oh, in the hospital. Absolutely. The, uh, the, rest of the research assistants mm -hmm. in physiology, the farm Ds and the pharmacy who were all trying to develop their own expertise within the health field, who actually taught us far more and far earlier than mm -hmm. either physicians or other PAs taught us of our craft, at least in the didactic. You know, uh, that, that whole team thing uh, goes back to what we are as PAs, that we are a member of a team. We are not a separate entity. And, and this was addressed in a number of, so that I am an assistant, an associate, but primarily for the patient. And all of those instructors and helpful people of various levels that helped me become a better PA, I then had in my brain when I went out into real life. And then I would, I could reach out and that physical, physical therapy taught me so much that those therapists that, let's say. And so I was able to reach out and say, hey, physical therapy can be a part of the help for this patient. Nursing can be, the psychologist, the the, the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, can be so helpful. The radiation, the, the, the radiation technologist, uh, they, they, they have information. They've studied. You can use that to help your patient. So we are a part of that huge team. And if you students can use that and not think of, you know, it's just me and the physician, then you're, you're missing out. Yeah, Blair and then Bill. Bernie, would you tell the second part of that wonderful story about if you ever write an order again, you know, the, the nurse will be fired. What was the next chapter? How did that get resolved? It, the next chapter was it probably took four years to get back to what had happened before that. Um, there was a change in nursing leadership at Yellow Haven Hospital with a um, chief nursing officer who absolutely believed there was no role in any institution for PAs. Actually, she went so far as she told my sister, who was a nursing administrator at the time, to go home and tell me that I needed to find something else to do with my life. Um, and it took Oh, it probably took, that was probably a year or two after I graduated, it probably took six or seven years before you could then, you know, comfortably write orders. And it depended upon where you were, and that was, that was one of the things that was so interesting about the profession. Jeff and Bruce are running around plastic surgery, doing what they needed to do, taking care of patients, everything was wonderful. And over on medicine, up four flights and around the corner, 
the world was totally different. So the inconsistency until there was hard and fast regulations that said you must, you should, um, it, it was difficult to cope with at times. But I, I'd say it probably took five years. Bill. As your comment about not having any uh, role models to follow, uh, being five years behind you and having the Bird Eat Kim, Luke Kim Chadwick, Jeff Heinrich, and Karen Marlin, and Charlie Park, all of those people that have been here and done it is a real inspiration. And I think, uh, you know, the classes that have followed you with that owe a great deal to all of you. Thank you. Drugs, drugs. I, I, <laughs> actually, actually, youth, youth saying the absolute belief, you know, when you're 22 years old, you, be, you believe. And I came out of the 60s, you know, so I believed that I could make this work. Um, along, that, along the same lines, I, when I, get, I left Yale, went into a rural practice in the middle of Iowa. Um, we had a, um, a small town of 900 people. Uh, my physicians opened up several satellite clinics. I was there all the time. The, there were two docs who came in uh, two half days a week. The rest of the time it was me. Um, the communications were, I, I, I looked at it very closely to make sure that there was going to be communications 24 hours a day, even though it was by phone. Um, and I was scared to death. But partly, as I said earlier, I was afraid, is anybody going to come and see me? So small story. I had been there maybe a year, um, was seeing a patient, uh, knock on the door. The nurse said, um, you have a long distance call, and it's important. I said, OK. So I came up, hello. Uh, this is Mr. Smith at the other end of the line, who was a farmer who spent his winters in Arizona from Iowa. And he, he says, I, I, I'm in trouble. I had some chest pain and some shortness of breath. And they took me to the hospital. And they did some tests. And then they said that they needed to operate on me. And I said, OK. He says, I'm, I'm afraid. And I said, OK. Did the doctors talk to you about it? Yes. Do you know what they're going to do? Yes. Do they, do you feel that you have trust? Yes. Um, are you in pain? You know, and so on and so on. Trying to reassure him. And, and I'm hearing in the background as I'm talking to him, male voices shouting. And I, and I eventually I say, well, well, who is that? That's the surgeon. <laughs> they want to take me to the operating room, but I, want, I needed to call you to see if it was OK. <laughs> he had to get an OK f uh, from five states away from his PA <laughs> that it was OK to go to the operating room. Now, basically, it says that, yeah, uh, to me, it said that, that my heart was still beating, that, that, uh, that we, he trusted me, and that he was that to, to maybe an exaggerated extreme, but that, that was, you know, one of those things in life that you feel, okay, maybe I'm doing the right thing, maybe I chose to do the right thing, and maybe people will come to see me. Okay, Jeff. Well, I think it's great now, you know, that we had trouble going to hospitals seven miles away. Now students are doing rotations in countries 7,000 miles away. Um, the, the world clearly is a different place than it was 40 years ago. Um, the acceptance of the profession is a different place. But you know, I think, I think the work's not done. 
I still think there's a lot of work to do. Um, I was at Yale when that Seligson report was going on. We were really worried that the program was not going to continue. And, and for a little while at some of those meetings, I had kind of an insider, one of the docs from the community that was on it was a good buddy, so I you know, would kind of get a little feedback. And things didn't look good at some of those meetings for us. You know, so I'm really happy to see that the university has now embraced the program to the extent that it has, which means to me the university is now behind the profession in a way that it was, but it wasn't in the early days. I mean, it, it was, but not with the emotion and the resources and the extent that it is now. I mean, if you look at my certificate, there is not an official university signature on it. It's these guys. That there changed was a pretty quickly. There was a question? Do you still have that question, sir? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanted to know, what was your background I was a very young college graduate who had fallen into the fact that I wanted to be a member of the healing arts uh, very late in my collegiate career. My first destination was to be a math professor. And when I got into flipping planes in space, I realized this was not for me. <laughs> so my goal was patient care. And as I weighed my options in the spring of 1970, I fell literally over a sign hanging on the first floor of Boardman that was the trauma program with the surgical associate program, and at that point started to investigate it. I did have patient care experience. I had done that summers during college. But I was different from the rest of my classmates. Um, they did more the ex-military Peace Corps kinds of things, different kinds of clinical experience. Um, so that was me, and I just wanted to take care of patients, and I was going to take the fastest route to get me there. And I looked at medical school. There was, I needed a couple of prerequisites. That would have been another year and a half, um, but I wasn't really interested in that anyway. Um, I looked at nursing school. Um, I have nurses in the family. I knew what those frustrations were as professionals, decided I didn't want to do that. And frankly, it was exciting being a pioneer and being part of something new. And, and I think I was partially drawn to, I don't know what this is going to be, but I think I'm going to do it. I think it was interesting that all five members of our class came from completely different kinds of backgrounds. And, and they chose us, I, I don't know how, because I, <laughs> honestly, I mean, there wasn't, I, I could never see a pattern. It was I could I could never see a pattern as, as I look at each of us. And, and sometimes I thought, well, gee, how can they do that without this background or or, and so forth, but I mean, everyone turned out to be an excellent, excellent provider, and, and so with their wisdom, they were able to do that. I personally came from, I was a medic in the service in the, in the Army, uh, and then uh, after college uh, at Ohio State, uh, my wife and I, um, hi Terry, uh, <laughs> we uh, decided we wanted to try to do something, maybe get back in that time when you possibly can. Uh, <clears throat> so we joined uh, VISTA, which is the Domestic Peace Corps, and we went to uh, the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation in Montana and worked, just present yourself in whatever skills you have to help them do what they need to do, what they want to do, you do. So <clears throat> I had medical background, so, and I was in a village way away from, and this is rural Montana, and so um, whatever came along medically was pretty much me, because there was nothing there in our village. And so I was off on, on the phone with the people at the, the docs at the Indian Health Service. And uh, <clears throat> we had some, some pretty bad cases. Um, but you know I tried to help what I could. Anyway, at the end of the bar time there, uh, the doc said, look, you know, you've got these skills. You certainly like to do it. You like people why don't you consider going to medical school? And I said, well, I never really, you know, seriously thought about that, but I am 30 years old. And uh, he said, well, let's, let's look, let's apply. So again, serendipity, his wife was a nurse. She had a nursing magazine. In there was a little article about their opening, uh, 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 looking for students for the first class at Yale, 
for PAs. And I looked at that too, and I said, well, this might be something good. It might be a stepping stone. It might be another way to learn. It might be another credential. Um, and so I applied. The joke was <clears throat> we had one phone in the village, okay, at the church. And so the joke was they had to send an Indian runner to get me to, so when Yale called and said, hey, you can come out. Uh, you know, but <clears throat> anyway, so that was basically uh, where, I'm, where I was coming from. I just wanted to say that um, I know that we have one international guest and we invited another individual. Um, they're uh, individuals from uh, Africa and China that will be joining us uh, at different times during the day to learn a little bit more about our profession. They happen to be here um, visiting Yale for other reasons and I wanted to invite them for that, you know, apropos to the conversation. Uh, we'll take one more question because I know we need to have a bathroom break. <laughs> In lieu of the question, may I make a, a, a oh, yes. hu humorous event that uh, maybe um, I was called, I was in, in my clinic in Iowa, and uh, there was, I was called to this, a scene where a, uh, a, a farm wife had tried to end her life with taking multiple uh, pills. Um, the re our rescue people went. Um, she would refuse to do anything except just sit there and die. Um, they called me. She was my patient. I went to the third farm on the right, and, um, and she wouldn't let anybody else get near her. She allowed me to be near her. We sat. We talked. Um, I had a bottle of Ipecac in my pocket, you know, and, and keep looking at my watch, you know, because time is... Is, is working against this every minute. Meanwhile, a helicopter, a rescue helicopter arrived. Most of the farmers are, are here, so we've got a big crowd. Uh, she says, I convinced her that she will go. Um, she took the Ipecac. I'm, I'm saying, okay. So I've got my arm around her. We come outside. Um, we are going to transport her because she's, she's going to die with the, with the bill she had. Um, she sees the crowd, gets scared, sits down in this farmyard. Okay. So I turn around, and we are sitting there, and I've got my arm around her, and we're just sitting in the grass in this farmyard, and try, because the, the crowd was behind us, the helicopter was behind us, and I think that was what was scaring her. Meanwhile, I'm trying to convince her, and meanwhile, I'm hoping that she's going to start to have some emesis. So she indeed does. And she's throwing up, and, and I can see actual some of the medicine that she had uh, consumed. Fine. Things are going well. Until about this time, there is this grunty noise. And I don't know if you've ever seen a full-grown hog. <laughs> they can stand about this high. They can be about 600 pounds. And... This hog is smelling the vomitus. It is now, I'm trying to keep this woman calm, and here is this, this hog trying to get in between our legs where she has vomited. Okay? It gets better. <laughs> Along with her, she's got at least a half a dozen little piglets, which are squealing now. The mother is calling the piglets. They're coming from all directions. They're going in and out around our legs. I am trying to be cool, but my, I'm kicking with my feet, trying to keep the things away. Um, you did not train me to handle this. <laughs> Patient survived. Things went well. But there are humorous things out there. That's a great way to end. Thanks.